on the first day of the spring semester, where here in Ithaca we are receiving thousands of students to an unusual, but also very intellectually stimulating semester, EMI is launching its first webinar of the spring semester. EMI wants to continue building bridges, encouraging dialogue across Africa, Latin America, China, and India. Today, with my colleagues and our partner institutions, we want to launch the Emerging Market Multinationals Report. In this report, we cover how, in the past decade, emerging markets have witnessed tremendous transformation and they are playing now an increasing role in trade and investment. Also, emerging markets have consolidated in the, since the beginning of the millennium their role in the global economy. The rise of emerging market multinationals is an illustration of their increasing clout in the global economy. The five reports have highlighted the remarkable headways of these enterprises in global business and their contribution to the changing global innovation and technology landscape. With the COVID crisis, 2020 is also a year of rupture, and the report explores some of the consequences of this crisis for emerging markets and the global economy. As this year, Emerging Markets Institute celebrates its 10th anniversary, this fifth report has been privileged to receive contributions from the M MNET at the OECD Development Center, Glo World Bank's uh, International Financial Corporation, the Division of Investment and Entrepreneurship at UNCTAD, the members of the Emerging Market Research Network, Wuhan University in China, and members of the Advisory Faculty Board, Advisory Council, a EMI Fellows, and EMI Team. So the next webinars, please, next slide, will be on Africa, uh, within the African American History Month, February 19th at 5 p.m. in collaboration with the Johnson African Business Society and EMI Fellows. The one on Latin America will be collaborating with the Latin American Studies Program at the Einaudi Center and the Latin American Business Association will be on March 22 at 4 p.m. The one on India on April 22nd and the one on China in May. And here I want to thank you, uh, EMI alum, uh, Gaurav Trivedi, and the student Aniruta Garwal for their help and all the students who are collaborating in these webinars. Next slide. So then I'll pass the word to my co-author and faculty fellow at EMI, Anne Miru. Thank you very much, Lourdes, and welcome to all uh, participants. So um, I'm just going to give a little background to the various presentations that you will get today. All of these presentations are actually chapters in the report, the 2020 Emerging Markets Multinational Reports. The title of the report is The 10 Years That Changed Emerging Markets, and basically the aim was to take stock of the past decade, what it meant for emerging markets. But I must say that by the time we were writing it, we had the COVID crisis eruption, and evidently, obviously, we could not avoid it. So we have a chapter on the implication, or the potential implication, of the crisis on emerging markets. Now, um, basically, what are the key messages of, of the reports? And you will see that, uh, basic, as I said, the chapters that will be presented to you, they are framed within the report. Um, the decade, the past decade, the 2010s, have been a decade of growth, less important than the previous decade, the 2000s, but still quite a remarkable 5.25% uh, overall for emerging market. And also a decade of poverty reduction. I'm talking about emerging market because we know that poverty is still a major issue for the world uh, globally. 
Second message is the rise of uh, emerging market. I'm not talking only about trade partner, but as investors, global investor. That's definitely one of the salient pitch feature of the 2010s uh, decade. And uh, in a way, because of that, another issue that decades we has been a decade of reckoning of the role of emerging market in the global economy. The third message is basically the focus, the essence of the Emerging Market uh, uh, Institute report, which is basically the prominent status, the rise of multinational from emerging markets. And we show that they are growing not only in numbers, but also they are becoming actually industry leaders. And if one take a 10 to 15 year perspective, one can see how the world has been completely changed by this phenomenon. The fourth uh, message on which we have really uh, focused, because it explains a lot, is basically the position and the rise of emerging market and their enterprises as global innovators and technology leaders. And to some extent, a number of the presentation today are really around this theme, which is a transformational issue, if I could say so. So we will have um, Lorenzo from OCD, which we talked about uh, the new technology and their uh, contribution to recovery in emerging market. We have Ravi, we'll talk about reverse innovation, which is a very intriguing phenomenon. But we'll also have unicorns in Latin America presented by uh, uh, Veneta from uh, Union Des. And we have also some aspect of uh, business enterprises by looking at uh, co talent competitiveness with uh, Annabella. And final presentation by um, Paloma about hospital, which, you know, given the situation, has rings more than a bell. Next slide. Next. So these are the, uh, we have 11 chapters, uh, as I just mentioned, and a number of contributors, uh, as uh, Lourdes said a moment ago. But, Two points that I would like to uh, flag before giving the, the floor to, to Lorenzo. The, 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 the first point I would like to, to flag is that in addition to the messages that I just mentioned in the increasing growth of emerging market, 5.2% as I said, compared to 5.9 the moment ago, compared to 1.7 for uh, the G7 countries. So you can see uh, the difference. There is a phenomenon which has actually become increasingly used is that there is a divide between China and the rest of emerging market. Uh, China is, is in a way an animal in itself and this has also implications for our work in the emerging market institutes because it's raising fundamental question. And there is also a divide between Asia and Latin America and perhaps one could say between Asia and the rest of the world. I have to mention Africa because I know that we have a number of students and people, uh, you know, from Africa listening to us. The growth in the in the continent has been 3.2 percent, but we all know that to talk about Africa as a group does not really make sense because the situations there are extremely different. We have a few emerging economy and a number of uh, least developed economies. So these basically are the message. Now, if we wanted to have a graph who represent, in a way, uh, just an illustration, a symbol of what's happening, you have it in front of you. It's basically the number of emerging market multinational in the 14 Global 500. A decade ago, 2010, we had about 60 from emerging market. 10 years uh, later, you have about 170. Of course, China is a culprit between quotation, because as you can see, it's an upward trend, very, I mean, I could, could say dramatic trend, to the point that nowadays you have more Chinese company in the Fortune Global 500 than US companies. So this is very telling whether this is going to uh, uh, remain. It's a question mark, but it's definitely an illustration of what has been happening in the past 10 years. I will close here my uh, very short uh, presentation and framing, and I will uh, give the floor to Lorenzo Pavone. Lorenzo is a deputy head of networks, partnership, and gender division in the OECD Development Center. Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne, and uh, it's very uh, good to be with you uh, today. 
Uh, as uh, you mentioned, uh, the OECD Emerging Markets Network in the Development Center wrote uh, uh, a chapter on new technologies as a lever for recovery in emerging markets. So we're going to give a little bit of an overview of the evolution of digitalization and new technologies uh, in, uh, in the past uh, uh, decades and uh, how we see the future, particularly looking at what the private sector thinks about uh, um, the potential of digitalization in, uh, in emerging markets. So next slide, please. I wanted to start by uh, showing that basically uh, uh, there is a widespread uh, um, connectivity that has allowed many to adapt to the crisis. So this is not something uh, new. Um, without digital technologies and related work practices, the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic will be uh, uh, much uh, worse. Some businesses, schools, and families uh, moved online. Tracking and tracing systems have helped uh, to monitor and analyze the spread of the virus. Uh, so in and all, there is no doubt that uh, uh, the impact of technologies helped us so far in our societies, but they will also be even more important in the future, even especially looking at this uh, slide, how our century has witnessed a rapid increase, for example, in the uptake of mobile connections which are growing now at a much higher speed than fixed broadband because of a number of factors. For example, the upgrade of infrastructure and technology. We see now, for example, the evolution from 3G, uh, that networks that uh, you know, uh, introduced a new age of calling, texting, and internet connectivity for mobile devices, now became a 4G that is 10 times faster. And uh, for example, if you want to download a movie of 800 megabytes, it used to take uh, five hours uh, with 3G, now it takes uh, less than a minute. So here, this explains uh, the dramatic uh, increase in the uh, mobile access paths in, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the uh, telephone lines that are going down, but also uh, the fixed broadband that is slightly increasing, but not at the speed of the mobile broadband. Um, this also meant that uh, a range of new mobile applications brought users away from the desktops towards the smartphones. And now, you know, we can do everything through the smartphones. Uh, we have estimations of billions of mobile uh, phone users around the world. 60% of the world population now uh, uses mobile phones. And the daily time spent online on mobile devices uh, in uh, 10 years went from half a minute 30, uh, half an hour, sorry, 32 minutes, to now more than two hours. Uh, some elements on the emerging markets, e-commerce, that uh, you know, uh, we also experienced uh, these days, came uh, to virtually nothing in, in 1999 to now about uh, 70 to 80 billion US dollars. Mobile phone penetration rate uh, in Africa is uh, something like 96%. Uh, leading to the development of a number of wireless services, for example, mobile uh, banking, e-commerce, online payments, that actually helped economies overcome the issue of poor uh, infrastructure, hard infrastructure. And uh, as Anne already mentioned also, that uh, uh, China, in China, for example, there is an active uh, internet user basis, something like uh, 800 million Chinese use internet, and 98% of them are mobile users, and uh, about 74% use mobile payments. Now, next slide shows uh, the top 10 investors in emerging markets in ICT. Uh, you can see immediately that in 2020, not surprisingly, there has been a collapse uh, caused by COVID. But next, if you look, uh, next slide, please. If you look at what's happening, uh, if you just uh, uh, take stock of the situation before the crisis, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, in the past few years, Chinese companies uh, have become the major, by far, investors in emerging markets, in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. Uh, Huawei, but, uh, Xiaomi, is a, uh, it's an incredible case of a company that was founded just in April 2010, and has become the, uh, the best, uh, the, the largest investor in, uh, um, in emerging markets. Next slide, please. Now here, important gaps remains in access to uh, high-speed broadband. But why is fiber important? This uh, uh, slide shows in particular uh, um, uh, trends uh, in, uh, um, in fiber connection, high-speed broadband. Well, because obviously through fiber, you have good video communications like what we're having today. 
and how many people have been working through uh, Zoom and uh, Teams and other platform. You need a uh, very good uh, connection, but also to, uh, to have a fast transfer of data, big data, and for the development of the 5G in the future. So on average, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the high-speed fiber in fixed broadband connection OECD countries rose from 12% 10 years ago to 27% now, with a number of discrepancies that you see obviously in this uh, slide that I'm not going to repeat. Uh, the focus a little bit on uh, emerging markets. In Sub-Saharan Africa, only 23% of the population has mobile internet access and uh, low broadband in most of the cases. In Latin America, 75% of the richest population uh, use internet but only 37 of the poorest. And in Southeast Asia, there are countries like, for example, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, where fixed broadband networks uh, is used by less than 1% of the population. Next slide, please. Now, if you look forward a little bit, uh, now we're talking about the future. Now, what is the private sector asking to support the digital transformation in emerging markets? So we asked uh, the companies that participate in our events, now, what reforms, for example, will uh, strengthen their ability to invest more in digital technologies in emerging markets. And uh, in terms of public policies, so you can see that there are three big clusters. Connectivity, where more people uh, must be able to access high quality connections. And uh, here uh, means uh, obviously uh, high quality in rural areas for disadvantaged households, and obviously the speed. It's interesting in the case of regional integration efforts to capture more economy of scales, increase information sharing, align regulations, enhance regional infrastructure networks that are very important. Um, obviously, tariffs and non-tariff barriers also are, are very important. And in all three regions, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, there are a number of uh, uh, um, regional integration efforts uh, that I'm not going to mention now, but uh, you all know about them, that take into account the digital, uh, digital uh, platforms. Human capital, obviously, you need to be able to use them and also companies need to find digitally skilled employees to function in this new world. Um, finally, some words on uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, this is important because on the one hand, uh, social and economic activities are incre increasingly rely on transborder flows of data and you need to have regulations uh, that help companies uh, uh, through international trade, uh, reducing trade costs. Uh, China, India, and Indonesia, for example, have uh, more trade restrictions in telecommunication services than all other countries analyzed uh, under uh, what we are so-called the OECD Digital Service Trade Restrictiveness Index, something we have at the OECD to measure uh, barriers in uh, uh, service trade. So uh, China and Indonesia are at the top, then for, there is Saudi Arabia, and then uh, India. On the other hand, we also need to develop regulations to increase the trust in digital technologies. Uh, and here it's also important uh, to work on uh, design new legislations, regulations around cyber security, data protection, privacy, uh, anticipate new trends in blockchains, big data, artificial intelligence. And I would like to conclude uh, with uh, an element also perceived investment risk uh, for, uh, for a direct investment company still wants stability, political and economic stability in countries, uh, especially when they need to invest uh, on the long term and they want to make sure that uh, uh, the, the upfront cost will be followed by uh, good years of uh, uh, revenues uh, for, uh, sort of, uh, to recollect the investment. I stop here and uh, I will now uh, pass uh, the floor to uh, Ravi Ramamurti, University Distinguished Professor of International Business and Strategy and Director of Center of Emerging Markets at Northeast uh, University. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to speak today about the concept of reverse innovation. This is an idea that I started working on about 10 years ago. Um, and I thought uh, I'd take a quick look back based on the, these last 10 years. What have we learned new about uh, this uh, phenomenon? Next slide. So the idea of reverse innovation is quite uh, simple. Uh, most of the innovations in the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution have gone from rich countries to poor developing countries. Next. Reverse innovation is when the opposite happens. That is when ideas go from the poor countries to the rich countries. Next. And this is somewhat counterintuitive because you don't expect ideas and innovations to go from de less developed countries to more uh, developed countries. 
But about 10 years back, we started working on this topic because it was becoming clear that after about 20 years of uh, economic liberalization, when many emerging economies opened up to the global economy, they were beginning to become important, interesting places, not only for economic growth, but also for uh, innovation. So the two main reasons why the innovation seems to be picking up in the emerging markets is that these countries have joined the global economy and that has provided them access to technologies they didn't have before, and also has led to faster growth in these countries. And so multinational firms have become much more interested in these countries than they used to be in the past. Next. I want to focus uh, next on three types of uh, reverse innovation in the few minutes uh, that I have. So next. So the first type of innovation I will illustrate for you with an example of uh, products going from the developed countries into the developing countries and having to be completely reinvented, not just marginally modified and adapted, but fundamentally reinvented. So this is a GE product for EKG machine, which you would sell in the advanced countries. It costs about $15,000, a wonderful product. But what the emerging markets needed was something like this. Next. Next, yeah. What it needed was a portable, small, inexpensive product that does about 80% of the functionality for less than 10% of the price. And that is the product that GE had to come up with. And of course, one of its advantages is that it's also portable and battery operated and simple to use. All of these features make it very attractive for the emerging markets. Having developed such a product for a country like India, GE discovered the product then had unexpected uses in the developed countries as well. And that is the process we call reverse innovation, which is ultimately when the lessons of the innovation in the emerging markets get transferred over to the developed uh, markets. Now, that's only one way in which you can tap into the innovations of the poor countries. Next. So the second type is where poor countries actually have an advantage because they're poor. And because they're poor, they deal with certain problems that don't arise very often in the rich countries. But sometimes rich countries face the same problems that poor countries have faced. And so the poor countries may be better at dealing with those problems. So the example that uh, I focused on for the last few years is healthcare. And the idea is that poor countries, because they have a tremendous shortage of doctors and facilities and medicines and uh, technology, and people often pay out of pocket, they cannot afford the Western solution. Now, it's a GE coming in and finding a, a, a local solution. In the case of healthcare delivery, uh, local players have in, come up with their own innovations. And they add up uh, to lots of small innovations that add up to a very fundamental uh, ability to provide world-class care at uh, ultra-low prices. So what we did was study uh, such innovative hospitals in India, and we found that they can... Uh, perform uh, very advanced, uh, say, medical procedures like open heart surgery for about 5 or 10% of the cost at which we do that in the U.S., but the outcomes are just as uh, good. Next, we wrote about these uh, ideas in this uh, book, uh, talking about how the U.S. can actually learn from the experience of uh, countries like India uh, and focused on uh, reverse innovation in the healthcare space. Uh, all of that published through Harvard Business Review or Harvard uh, Business Review Press. Recently, I found another example of this kind of opportunity for learning from poor countries, and that is with respect to fighting COVID. And here the story is very simple again. Poor countries have had to control infectious diseases for a long time. So they have much more practice doing it. Because before the before COVID, there was SARS, or there was Ebola, and Zika, and, you know, you name it. You know, each country had dealt with these issues over a period of time. So they accumulated a set of practices that they could then apply to COVID, and they have actually, in some cases, have had death rates from COVID that are one percent or less than the death rates we've had in the developed countries across the board, whether it's the U.S. or even. The, countries like Germany have had much, much higher rates of COVID deaths than these countries. So we said, what is it we can learn from these countries? What should we have learned from these countries? Next. And uh, I wrote up some of these things uh, in Harvard Business Review. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing we did was create a website with all 50, about 50 ideas that we had, thought we had observed in the 
emerging economies on how they fought COVID. And we encourage developed countries to actually uh, learn from these countries and made it easier for them to learn from those countries. Next. And we call the website Reverse Innovation to Fight COVID-19. It's at, on our Center for Emerging Markets website. And it has ideas in all these different areas from prevention to testing to, to treatment uh, and so on. The last example I want to give of uh, reverse innovation, which is the last type, next slide, is where the emerging market companies, and this ties back to something Anne was talking about earlier, our emerging market companies themselves become first movers in innovation. That is, they are not just places where, you know, Western companies can go and modify their existing products, uh, but actually where companies in these countries are able to be first movers, not only within their country, that is not just first to the emerging market, but first to the world. And uh, some of you will be familiar with these examples. Next. Uh, in, in the case of aircraft, from we've had for many years now a, a well-known company called Embraer that produces world-class uh, uh, products. Uh, next, in telecom equipment, Huawei is an ex interesting, probably the most impressive, most interesting example of a company that has caught up, uh, you know, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and eventually caught up and has overtaken Ericsson and some of the other Western players to become a global first mover in 5G. Uh, in electronic payments, we all know the case of M-Pesa in Kenya, which was pioneered e-payments. Uh, this is not a case of a company catching up. They were actually the f one of the first to use the phone as, a, uh, as an instrument for conducting uh, economic transactions. And finally, uh, in the case of social media, we've seen now re new players coming out of China and super apps like WeChat and then TikTok. Uh, th again, these are first movers and because they're at the forefront and new to the world, not just new to China, uh, any innovation of that kind obviously has relevance to the rest of the world, including the developed countries. And to wrap up what uh, Lourdes set off and answered in the beginning, uh, the main point is that, you know, we shouldn't think of uh, emerging markets just as markets where we can sell our existing products, uh, but actually as important places for innovations and not just for their local markets and not just for other emerging markets, but even for the developed uh, markets. With that, I'll conclude and it's a uh, Pleasure now to turn it over to uh, Professor Vanita Andanova, who is the Dean of the Business School at uh, University of uh, Los Andes in Colombia. Over to you, Vanita. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, I will continue uh, Ravi's um, idea about uh, companies that bring innovation or that are driven by um, innovation and, and digital excellence. Next slide, please. So um, the chapter that I will present is the joint work of myself, um, Juana Garcia, an associate professor at the school, and Andres Guerrero, who is the director of the Center for Interpretation entrepreneurship at Universidad de Los Andes. So we are looking at, um, a, 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 let's say, a rare but fascinating uh, creature called unicorns, comparing what uh, the data reveals about this uh, very high growth, high valuation, innovation and digital driven companies um, between emerging and uh, developed markets. Um, next slide, please. Before we continue, I want to highlight some of the uh, very specific um, attributes of, of the unicorns and why we picked unicorns as a phenomena that would reveal um, how uh, healthy is the innovative and the entrepreneurial capabilities in uh, the ecosystems in emerging and developed um, economies. So these companies called unicorns are a relatively small uh, group of, of companies um, and they have a very flat organizations. Normally they are backed by venture capital firms. Um, they uh, also uh, normally are supported by serial entrepreneurs. Um, they, they are run by the lean startup philosophy that 
tend to be very narrowly focused on, on um, uh, growth and scaling up through digital uh, technology, and they prioritize growth and in this uh, uh, regard, internationalization. So these are the companies we wanted to analyze, and we used uh, the data set of the CB Insights, that's a tech market intelligence platform uh, that publishes the global unicorn list. So uh, what we learn uh, first sight, what we when we look at the data, is that globally near half of the unicorns uh, come from the U.S., uh, but uh, every th three of every uh, ten uh, unicorns come from China. So uh, certainly, I will relate to what Anne mentioned earlier, um, and that is. China really is playing a game uh, in its own category. Next slide, please. So um, here you can see a map uh, that compares uh, the uh, frequency of unicorns uh, as reported by CBS Insights at the end of 2020. 20, um, in relation to the emerging 20 list of companies, the E20 classification um, has been uh, offered by the Emerging Market Institute um, in uh, 2016. So we basically followed that same method. Um, and what we found uh, and what you can see there is that emerging uh, markets um, uh, behave very differently in relation to unicorns, in particular, you can see a huge level of concentration in Asia and especially China, where we find 119 unicorns as of end of 2020. Um, well, there normally, uh, because of that overwhelming effect, there is little attention given to other emerging areas of the world. And uh, this is why uh, I will uh, focus a bit more on one of these areas that apparently is, is falling behind with comparing when compared to Asia Pacific and China and that's Latin America and um, I will focus a bit on, on Latin America and what follows without losing uh, the focus on the emerging uh, economies and general. So according to the average firm value by sector, unicorns are more highly valued in emerging uh, countries than they are in uh, developed economies. And uh, this is um, an interesting observation uh, to be made. Now, sector-wise, how do unicorns in emerging and developed economies compare? Next slide, please. So here we provide the answer uh, to this question. And certainly we, um, in the chapter, we um, uh, found um, a pattern. While unicorns in emerging economies are dedicated to providing solutions in relatively low tech mass domains, such as e-commerce, direct to consumer services, supply chain, logistics, delivery, and ad tech, Unicorns in developed economies and China that in this regard behaves as a developed economy uh, dominate knowledge intensive technology domains such as cybersecurity, artificial intelligence and analytics, domains in which Lorenzo called for more regulation and more thoughtful uh, development of rules in order uh, for societies to benefit from these um, uh, new areas of knowledge. We conjecture that the natural and endowed conditions of the emerging economies, such as their large populations um, that are coupled with lack of basic infrastructure and services, offer excellent opportunities for these unicorns um, that can provide solutions and even allow technological leapfrogging in basic services. And we identify banking and education as uh, areas that have a very high potential to bring fast progress to emerging um, economies. Um, next slide, please. Um, in what uh, remains uh, of, of my time, I would like to focus on a region that by own standards has been falling behind the Asia Pacific and China. And this is Latin 
Latin America. And I'd like to offer some hope because um, this is also part of uh, this year's um, EMI report. Um, and I'd like to talk uh, about three particular examples. I will start very briefly uh, characterizing new bank. Um, this is uh, a Brazilian neo bank. It's a type of direct uh, bank that operates exclusively online and it's the largest fintech in Latin America. Uh, well, they think of themselves as a tech company, not as a bank. And um, they, uh, in, in, it was three years ago, in February 2018, when New Bank reached the billion dollar valuation status. And uh, since um, uh, 2019, it uh, has become the sixth largest bank in Brazil. So it's really huge, very uh, accelerated growth curve. And this giant fintech company has operations in, in um, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and they have their engineering department in Europe, in Berlin. Um, and uh, what it does is uh, it places the customer in the center of the strategy and develops technology that aspires to change the complexity of the Brazilian and Latin American uh, banking industry. So a uh, very disruptive, very aggressive uh, player that can bring bankerization to vast sectors of uh, Latin American um, uh, citizens. Rappi is another example that's a Colombian uh, company. It provides a marketplace platform for three types of users. Um, these are the buyer, the Rappi delivery person, and the business partner. And Rappi is a platform that connects people who have free time with those uh, who have um, very little uh, time, but do have a uh, budget to pay for, for services. Um, in what uh, Ravi mentioned, Rappi is rapidly uh, developing into a super app. Um, and uh, it is adding new services on the platform, such as uh, payment and even entertainment, uh, following uh, Asian example, as, as Ravi mentioned. And finally, Mercado Libre, that's the oldest, the most well-established unicorn in Latin America. Uh, it's the most popular e-commerce site in the whole um, region. And it, it became um, uh, the first um, uh, company, uh, Latin American company listed on the NASDAQ uh, back in 2007. So it's really huge. That's the largest, most established uh, unicorn of the region, uh, basically uh, providing, let's say, uh, the light for the rest of them. So what makes all these uh, examples uh, similar? to each other. Uh, well, we believe that despite the fact that these unicorns rely more on their uh, innovative business model that is new to the context, but not new in general, uh, they actually operate um, in the cutting edge of technology um, uh, innovation uh, without being first movers, but they are amazingly resilient and very capable of adapting these business models to the region's economic and social landscape. This dynamism that unicorns bring to Latin America, we believe, enable de facto leapfrogging as a realistic midterm option, especially in domains where a disruption of the status quo can unleash powerful social and economic progress. And we see such areas um, to be education and banking. And uh, with this note of optimism, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, a very dear colleague and friend of mine from the Latin American region, Professor Anabella Davila from EGADE Business School, Tecnológico de Monterrey. Ana? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Lourdes for the opportunity to contribute this year to the annual report. And please, next slide. Uh, I will address what Lorenzo and all other speakers uh, talk about the challenge competitiveness in Latin America and the challenges and opportunities for uh, multinational companies. So next slide, please. When uh, Lourdes asked us to reflect on the 10 years of uh, performance in Latin America or in emerging markets in, in general about our topics, I started to look what uh, competitiveness pillars were out there so I can take a huge look in the past 10 years and how to 
advice for the next uh, time. And I look, next slide please, I, I look at, uh, at three uh, pillars which are very important. One is the, uh, I mean, they are included in the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Report and one is health. And here I'm sharing you 10 years of health performance in most of the countries in Latin America. And I'm sharing two slides, uh, two charts here because uh, the report changed in, uh, 19, in 2018, not only the metrics, but also the scale. So more or less, I would like to, uh, to that you see that we have a stable investment in health infrastructure. However, we have to be very careful here because the OECD warn us and make us to observe territorial territorial inequalities. That means that all in like in many emerging markets, including Latin America, some states or some regions in the same countries have more investment in infrastructure than other regions. So for this, these are challenges for our for multinationals. And I have two, two questions in here. First, how should companies respond to protect their workers, in particular during the pandemic, of course? And one major challenge that multinationals always face is what type of practices should I standardize or should I operate locally because of these territorial inequalities? Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of skills, this is an endemic problem in Latin America in particular. As you can see, it seems like uh, improvement in skill development, which is very needed right now in terms of the digitalization of the economies. Uh, I think so. it, it looks like it's not in the political agenda to improve the uh, the skills of our population. So the question for multinationals is how can we gain or how can we offer this geographical advantage when they, uh, when these multinationals encounter a shortage of well-trained workers. Next slide, please. The third pillar is related to the labor market efficiency. And as you can see also, although we have a stable uh, performance, it really runs low for the scales, in particular during the last two years. So the question for multinationals here is how multinationals can or should design global talent management under these scenarios. So I have some uh, insights that we can offer opportunities, not only uh, for Latin American, but also multinational, but also for international multinational that want to invest in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of, well, there is a typo there. I don't know what happened there. But the main opportunity that I see if multinationals want to uh, implement global talent management, meaning talent allocation, development, and rotation of uh, their workers, well, in terms of health, one thing that they have to take into consideration very highly is to compete with benefit packages because it seems like the infrastructure for health, it's right now with the pandemic, we can see that it's not covering what we really need. In terms of education, uh, I have seen that more than just investment, investing in corporate training programs, or corporate universities, the, the, the opportunity here is to develop these alliances and network of educational institutions that other companies are doing it. For example, right now, uh, Puerto de Liverpool, which is a retail company, uh, more than 100 years old, open its uh, uh, virtual university to the community and make alliances with local university to provide for professional degrees to all the employees and all families of the employees and also uh, communities enrolled in this university. So the opportunity more than just uh, looking at what my employees need to perform well is to open and make these alliances. 
Uh, in terms of labor market efficiency, what uh, I would like to recommend to many companies is to uh, try to, to, to perform like a role model, a role model that makes sure that they implement not only in their facilities or in their operations, but also along the supply chain, international labor standards. And when you are a company that promotes and knows, and the society knows that you are implementing labor, international labor standards, other companies not only can imitate you, but can follow you and want to increase your, um, uh, to, to cooperate to increase the labor market efficiency. And we have to forget about those uh, institutional forces about uh, or obligating companies to do it. We have to make these companies to come uh, and belong, uh, I mean, become a role model. So those are my recommendations for the future. And now I would like to turn uh, the floor to my colleague, um, Fernanda Paloma Fernandez from the University of Barcelona. Go ahead, um, Paloma. Thank you, Annabella. Uh, thank you, the Emerging Market Institute and professors Casanova and Miro for their invitation to participate. Uh, I have also a contribution in this uh, seminar about uh, health. Um, following some of the arguments that Professor Davila and Professor Ramamurti have provided in this seminar. Uh, I am going to deal with the importance of investing in hospitals in emerging markets, something that takes a, a long time uh, or in order to, to have uh, effects on, on, and have an impact in the economy of the regions. Next, please. The key questions of uh, the role of hospitals in the economy of emerging markets are, first of all, uh, if uh, uh, well-being is about economic growth, if well-being is about uh, the productivity of uh, or the innovation of companies, or is it rather to facilitate the access to healthcare and welfare institutions in countries that in emerging markets are very unequal, not just in the income of their citizens, but unequal in the diversity of access systems to health products and health uh, services. How can we measure health spending? How can we measure improvements in life expectancy? There are international institutions that after the 1960s provided international data, which we can use to compare not just uh, between developing economies and developed countries, but also among the developing economies. However, we don't know much because usually there are problems of comparison. As we all know, uh, there are many times no data or we have bad data for emerging economies. Uh, in all kinds of uh, studies about financial uh, issues real, that have to do with uh, insurance companies, uh, multinationals uh, in medical equipment, pharmaceutical uh, companies. The, they are not transparent and the regulations in many countries do not oblige to have uh, information or records that uh, academic scholars can use for comparisons. So I, I, I claim and um, I use history as a laboratory in order to have lessons on what kind of data, uh, even if not perfect, could be used in order to have comparable data about hospital equipment that can be used to compare for countries for which we don't have 
official good data. And one of the results of my research in my contribution uh, is that history uh, publications and history research reveals that hospital beds per inhabitant, even if it, if it is not the perfect indicator about healthcare infrastructure, it's a good proxy because usually uh, health is a labor intensive activity. For each bed, you require at least a nurse and at least you require basic medicines. So even if it's not good indicator of investment, if you have a regular data of hospital beds and inhabitants in a city, in a country, in a hospital, in a health center, you can compare across time and across territories. That's what I have been doing in the last years, and I have been providing some series and data about hospital beds. Next, please. The World Economic Forum uh, is indicating that uh, this is not just a question that interests uh, people like me, who are historians. This is something serious that is affecting the future of the world economy. Uh, if there are estimates uh, that the emerging economies may drive one third of global health expenditure by 2022. So this is uh, really uh, one of the most important uh, drivers in the history of emerging economies. It's uh, something that is particularly leading China. Today, Russia and China, according to the World Economic Forum, but also to some private uh, studies like Siemens Health in Years, uh, they have many more beds per 1,000 population than the US today. And South Africa and Brazil are close to the North American figures. As you can see here, these are hospital beds per 1,000 persons. Uh, of course, figures uh, hide complexities. Of course, in, there are some, uh, these uh, 3.1 hospital beds per 1,000 inhabitants in the US. Uh, reveals that there's a huge inequality in the dissemination of hospital beds in the country, as well as in Russia or as well as in China. Despite this, the total numbers uh, have good indicators of uh, potential welfare, potential change that uh, reveal that there's uh, some improvement, which is very interesting, that it's taking place in emerging economies. Russia, but in this table also in China and South Africa or Brazil. The exception is India. In all the international reports about hospital beds per person, per 1,000 persons, India always uh, remains very far from China, which means that it has a lot of things uh, that must be done, possibly the reverse innovation that Professor Ramamuri was uh, mentioning before, will play a great role in order to improve these uh, low figures. Next, please. Hospital bed density is uh, uh, an indicator that can be prepared for the last uh, 10 years or 20 years that can reveal changes, interesting changes. I have elaborated this table with data from the World Health Organization for the years 2000 and 2017, which is the last year, for some countries 2018, for which there are comparable world data on hospital beds, right? So it will be like the last 20 years. Clearly this table reveals something which not many people believe, but that has taken place, which is the slow reduction in the number of hospital beds per 1,000 population and 10,000 population in this table that has been taking place in general in the world due to severe cuts, severe reduction in health investment everywhere in the world. One big exception, which is really incredible, China. If you see most of the countries emerging economies or 
developed economies all slowly have reduced investment and number of beds in their hospital, except China. You see that uh, the change has been from 16.8 per people to 43.1 beds in hospitals per 10,000 people. Of course, this has a role, among many others, in explaining also political issues, of course, in the capacity that China has revealed to control, to serve the needs of many millions of people these days during COVID uh, crisis. If you see India, the difference with China, it's outstanding. It's uh, really impressive how far India has remained. India was three times fewer hospital beds per 10,000 people than China in 2000. But today, India is not just below the year 2000, but it's the distance. The gap has increased enormously with China, which means that China has not only been investing in their industrial multinationals, in their economy, in their urbanization, China has also been investing heavily in improving their hospital capacity in order to serve the many needs of their millions of people in the country, essential in order to improve well-being and also in order to have people well-fed and well-cared in order to be efficient in their industries. The Russian Federation is above, is uh, above the figures of China, but still you see that has declined regarding the year 2000, which means that uh, still it's a leading country in Asia, and it has many lessons to provide. There's a lot of potential for growth. Uh, there's in Brazil an instability in the number of hospital beds, a still house, the number of China, Mexico well behind, something which is not atypical. These numbers are very standard in Latin America. I have not provided here tables. I just published an, a recent article about uh, hospital beds per 10,000 people in Latin America. And this 9.9 .9 in Mexico is double in average the number of hospital beds per 10,000 people in the rest of Latin American countries. Latin America is really in very, very bad shape, but in huge need of investment in the region. So the Chinese improvement uh, in the face of this low level of Latin America means that Latin America must not just invest in innovation, Latin America must invest much more seriously in improving their hospital capacity, their hospital system. Uh, next, please. Uh, These, uh, I, I think, are some of the drivers of the change that must take place in the future in order to improve hospital capacity that may improve the well-being of uh, emerging markets, health systems. Basically, this line in red, the out-of-pocket private expenditure is now dominant in all emerging markets. So most health access is made by paying from your own pocket, be it to a health insurance company, be directly in the hospital desk. So that's the main way for, through which most people in emerging markets get health assistance with out-of-pocket private uh, spending. That must be reduced. In most of the most successful models, there must be a combination. These two directions, so that I think that in many countries like uh, Southeast Asia, and um, also in the Andean countries, Brazil particularly, there's the direction of combining the public administration, health assistant, and health uh, hospitals with private clinics and private laboratories uh, in alliances with foreign multinationals, uh, as it happens in Brazil or in Peru, in Mexico, 
or to explore much more, as in Mexico, the collaboration of public administrations and the private sector, as it also happens in Argentina, very, very outstandingly. So innovation, as Professor Ramamuti was saying, yes, is some of the lines of the future to improve this well-being and the improvement of health capacity, and especially the promotion of medium-sized companies and the protection of free market policies for that. Um, with this, I want to thank Lourdes. Thank you, and I'll give you the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, please, next slide. We Time is up. So uh, here is all the collaboration of all uh, in the EMI uh, in the in the in the report. Thank you to all the uh, all, all the institutions that have collaborated. Thank you to the presenters today, and also thank you to the EMI research team: Daniel uh, Dos Anjos, Vinita Pachaba, Mijika Bajate, Andrew Lee, Momuk Shakicha. Very grateful. Thank you to Chris. Uh, Wolford and uh, his team who has uh, allowed us uh, to do organize this webinar. I'm sorry, no time for Q&A, uh, but we offer to please send us an email directly to contact EMI at cornell.edu and we'll answer your questions. Uh, we have your questions and we'll answer. Some of you have already added your email, so please do so. I believe today, uh, uh, sign, so uh, Paloma's presentation brought us to reality. So the reality, the reality of uh, the reality of COVID, the reality of how uh, health systems have been saving and and, and reducing uh, beds and other expenditures, and has made the pandemic worse. And also, no no wonder emerging markets, as uh, uh, Professor Ravi Ramamurthy said have had a better expansion, a better uh, solution sometimes and more rapid to COVID because, not only because they were prepared, but also because they had invested more in health and the numbers for China and uh, Korea are very clear. So thank you all and thank you. Uh, a message of optimism in general for emerging markets beyond COVID, emerging markets have done well and with innovation and technology that was the subject of many of the presentations, Veneta, the, the OECD Development Center, Ravi, uh, show how emerging markets, this is going to be again, and they seem to get out of the, of the COVID crisis better and faster, and maybe also the decade, the next one of emerging markets. Thank you all. The next report will be on uh, environmental, social, and governmental issues in ESG. Why? Because we believe that emerging multinationals will, will continue to occupy a significant position in the global economy, and with that, it comes increasing responsibilities. Emerging multinationals have to be more transparent, be aware of the social challenges in their markets, and also be sustainable and be responsible to the environment, and we want to explore that. So thank you all very much. Thank you to all the panel members, Lorenzo, Ravi, Veneta, Anabella, and Paloma. And of course, uh, on behalf of my co-author, Anne Miru, and myself, looking forward to continue the discussion. Thank you all, and have a great semester. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>